Hey Axis and Allies players, the good captain here and welcome to episode four in my Axis and Allies clinic series. In this video, I'm going to be doing a review of two third-party variants of Axis and Allies. The first is called East and West, produced by Imp Games in the year 2000. And the other is called Central Powers, produced by Table Tactics and released in 1995. So before I get into the individual reviews for each of these variants, I want to discuss a little bit about how I got here. So normally on this channel, I'm interested in reviewing versions of Axis and Allies that I consider part of the canon. Uh, that is, any version that has the name brand Axis and Allies on it and has Larry Harris, the game designer, somewhere in the credits. But after playing many, many games of the many different versions of Axis and Allies in that canon, I've come to really appreciate the origins of Axis and Allies. At this point, I'm starting to feel very strongly that the best version of Axis and Allies as a game, not as a historical simulator, but as a game that can be played by virtually anyone, is the Milton Bradley 2nd Edition. So each of these variants uses the Milton Bradley 2nd Edition rules as a foundation. Coupled with that, I actually had a willing opponent for each of these. It was a different person. I played two games of Central Powers over the board with a live opponent friend of mine, and I played about six games of East and West against a fellow who goes by the name of the Janus on the AxisAndAllies.org forum. And I was really impressed with how they both worked out and functioned, and I attribute a lot of that to the second edition rule sets. East and West technically operates under third edition rules, which was released with the 1998 CD-ROM, but for all intents and purposes, this is just a very few minor tweaks to the original rule set. So with that out of the way and to tee up off the intro, let me bring up East and West. But one more quick note, if you own a copy of East and West, you are the owner of a unicorn. This variant cannot be found. It is essentially unfindable. I have looked on eBay for many, many months. It just doesn't exist. So how did I play these games, you might ask? Well, it's actually available as a free download. It's a free game to play. So while I transition to my computer and mic up, I'm gonna roll across the three photos that exist of this game on Board Game Geek, so you can get an idea of what the physical board looks like. I'll introduce the game proper, and then you'll see why that this is essentially the red alert of Axis and Allies. So when you open MapView, which is the free-to-play program that East and West is located on, this is available in the link in the description box below, by the way, so you could even download this and follow along if you wanted. Uh, go to File, New Game, in the top center is East and West, and click OK. Now don't get overwhelmed by what you're looking at. Uh, we'll go through it a little bit, and it'll make more sense. First, just notice how similar this version is on this platform to the maps you saw in the photos from Board Game Geek. They did a pretty good job of matching like with like. So the first thing I'm going to do here is subtract one cruiser from the Soviet fleet in the Barents Sea. That's the only setup glitch that we found while playing this. So let me introduce this game. The setting is the year 1948. You can call this an alternate timeline or whatever, but World War II is not even three years old, and the Cold War has gone hot. And this is where I would say the first similarity between the computer game Red Alert from the 90s uh, comes into play here. Both are Cold War scenarios. Another similarity is the text that both sides start out with. The Soviets have a unit called Heavy Tanks, or Heavy Armor while the Americans start out with the atomic bomb. And I'm gonna scroll over to the west coast and you can see this nuclear symbol, that's the atomic bomb. The tech trees where these are marked are located at the bottom of the map. And there are four tech trees. And this is where there is a slight variation from the original second edition rules. Instead of having six techs, there are essentially 12, or uh, excuse me, yeah, 12. And both sides start out with one. But they're broken into four tech trees, so you cannot just, uh, I don't know if you could see this on YouTube, but there's a nuclear weapons tree, and the Americans start out with fission weapons. So if they declare that they would like to roll on the nuclear weapons tech tree, they cannot go to fusion weapons, which is the final uh, version of that tree. 
they have to go to ballistic missiles. But if they didn't want missiles and say they wanted to upgrade their aircraft, they could do that. But they have to grind through the first tech, which is jets, before they can get long-range aircraft. So I hope that makes sense. I hope you see how that works. And then I hope you can see that the Soviets have a peg on heavy armor and uh, the Americans have a peg on fission weapons. So let's move back to Western Europe where all the action is. And just to kind of clean up the uh, similarities between Red Alert and this version of Axis and Allies, the bombers can each carry a paratrooper. One of the tech trees, the armor tech, actually at the end has something called a self-propelled artillery. Here, I'll pull one out. You can see it right there up in this C zone, hopefully. <laughs> but probably the biggest similarity and the reason I kind of put together that intro aside from all these other little things, is the spying. So in the bottom right hand corner of the map as I scroll over and then down is this little box called uh, spying. And so you can actually purchase spies. Uh, there's a limit on how many you can purchase, but essentially each turn you can make a spying roll depending on how many you have and uh, what you would like them to do. Um, on a roll of a one with a D6, you can either select diplomacy, espionage, or counterintelligence. Spies don't actually exist on the game board. It's a third dimension. Counterintelligence is fairly simple. It basically means you can steal an opponent's tech. Um, espionage is, is essentially trying to assassinate an enemy spy and prevent them from doing one of these two things. And the third and perhaps most influential is diplomacy. And this segues nice into the other third dimension of this game, which is the diplomacy. Uh, there's neutral countries all over the map in this whitish manila color you see here. Um, on a roll of one you can convert uh, those countries and their armies to your side, but you can also influence one of the three major neutral alliances. If you'll notice there's this blue area here, it's China, this yellow area here, this is the Arab nations, and then of course the purple area here down in South America. Uh, these are three neutral alliances that can go four degrees either way, right? So if you look left to right on this influence chart, Arab League can go four notches in favor of one of the Allied powers, or four notches in favor of the USSR, and spying is a major factor in influencing them. You'll notice that the South American alliance is one notch in favor of the USA, while China is two notches in favor of the USSR. I'm not going to go into all the details of what this means, but you do get benefits. The further along they go, you can get more money, access to those territories, and if you get all the way over to one side, they will join your side. Um, IPC value, armies, and all. And again, that's all through this diplomacy aspect. And now I'll say a little bit about the turn order. So the Russians go first, and there is essentially this big surprise attack, if you will, on Western Germany, where there's a lot of valuable equipment. And I know it looks kind of messy right now. It's not important that you understand all the aspects and ins and outs of the game. Um, but generally speaking, the Russians will take Western Europe, destroy that lot of units. Um, usually Turkey goes down, usually Greece goes down, so the Western Europeans are kind of rolled back on their heels. And in the east, there's some fun trickery that you can do with the Soviet Navy to kind of capitalize on taking advantage of certain strategic situations out in Japan and kind of ensure the elimination of South Korea. So yeah, um, what I'm going to do now is walk through maybe part of the first turn, which starts, of course, with the Soviets, so I can show you how you play this via email. It's a pretty robust system, but it does take a lot of work, and you need a little bit of patience to play it. So the Soviets start out with a 20 IPC kicker. If you play the Soviets, you can spend 20 IPCs pre-game. There are some versions of Axis and Allies that have this type of rule. And Soviet infantry cost only two IPCs, so generally speaking, I like to uh, to buy uh, you know ten infantry. So you can see you can right-click this and make the value ten. So there they are, uh, and then you place them. And the way you do this by email is for every phase in Axis and Allies, you are gonna make a frame and I know that doesn't make sense so let me just show you at the bottom of the screen is this tab called the initial setup so this is our first frame let's just say for simplicity's sake we're gonna put um, I think there's setup restrictions yeah I think yeah right you can only put as many infantry as the value is of the territory right so let's just split off two and then I'll just put these two here and I just want to show you what it looks like when you uh, I'm gonna say uh, to show my opponent that I've added two to this region here, Yugoslavia, 
you can see it's green. It's the number is highlighted in green, whereas the others are highlighted in yellow. So that's that's how I let my opponent know that I pre-gamed two pieces. But now let's say it's my actual purchase. So let's just say I placed all my pre-game units. And now it's my actual purchase units phase. What do I do? I go to the game menu and click Add Map. Then I name it S1 Purchase. Okay. Hit OK. And notice on the bottom now we're on a different map or a different uh, frame, so to speak. And I forget how much the Soviets start with, but let's say we buy a tank and a plane and some infantry. Okay, it doesn't really matter. Now we leave those up here in the box. This is sort of the purchase box. Now we're gonna do the combat move. So we go to game, add map, um, R1 uh, combat move. I'll just spell it all. We're either like CM1 or RCM1, you know, something like that, new frame. And now we're gonna move pieces to attack. So I'm just gonna demonstrate very quickly how this works. Uh, on the left hand side is these, are these little tabs. You can see USSR, West Europe. So that's how you can get to the different equipment of the side that is currently playing, right? But under miscellaneous are, are these little uh, blue and red arrows. So the red arrow is for a combat move. I know this is gonna look weird, but you can actually drag the arrow around and show where certain units are coming from. So we're gonna just push these units into uh, this area here, and then we're gonna say, you know what, we're gonna have Poland hit it too. And we can even stack them up on top of each other, sort of fold them in. And and this is kind of a mess. It's, it's sort of like France, right? We're gonna put everything out in the ocean. Have you guys seen this? When in G40, there's so many pieces in France, you can't see what's what. So you kind of just bring them out. You could do something like that. Maybe that's not the best example, but you get the idea. You use the little red arrows to show where the attacks are coming from. And then uh, you roll the dice. And this is probably the biggest drawback because there is no onboard dice server, unfortunately. There's no in-game in dice roller. You have to use one of the very many that are available on the internet. So I'll just show you one as a quick example. There's probably better ones than this, but for this one, which is pbegames.com slash roller, you put in your email address, your opponent's email address, um, show the results, number of dice rolls, one, dice type, one D6, right? We're only using D6, just uh, test, okay? And then you scroll to the bottom and hit submit. And uh, you can have the report sent to you right here on the same website, and it will go to your inbox too. Uh, so you can see that this roll was a four. Your opponent gets the roll, you get the roll. It's a, it's a live dice. But that's how it runs basically all through. I'm going to go ahead and shift over to a, a dead game, one that I played as the Soviets, so I can show you. So here I, I did my 10 infantry purchases, and you can see them kind of dotted around the map. They're in green. Um, and then on my first turn purchase, uh, I bought 26 more infantry. So I guess the Soviets start with 52. And uh, here's my combat move, right? So not necessarily the first territory you enter is going to be an attack. So that's what the blue arrows are. Any kind of movement that doesn't result in combat. So that way I, my opponent could see uh, what I was thinking, what I was doing. Okay. Um, yeah, I think this is pretty, this is pretty clean. Um, so this is kind of my moves out in the out in the Pacific and the t an attack into South Korea you know this is a little more sane over here less peace counts you can kind of see what's going on so these fleet units moved out and over and uh, yeah it's a lot of fun so and then when you and then you get to the combat phase and you go through and you roll the dice and you make the adjustments as you're rolling them with the roller right so in this situation it looks like the Soviets took Turkey they took Greece they took South Korea, they took West Europe, and they took Norway, okay? Again, this is, I feel like this is a fairly standard opener for this game. And then the next frame is the Soviet one non-combat move. And this is one big difference between the second edition rules in East and West. It's that armor units that didn't use all their movement can continue moving. So you can move in and then out of a territory. So this is great for kind of like... Uh, protecting what you might call, or what we would call core units, what I call core units. So all my armor just bounces out of West Germany, bounces out of Greece, and goes into the interior lines to, to come back and do mayhem, uh, you know, on the next turn or the next turn or wherever. So, right, so anyway, that's the non-combat move. And then placement. 
So um, in this version of the of Axis and Allies, you can place infantry units on on any territory that has a value up to the limit of that value. So you don't need an industrial complex to place infantry. It's a fairly common rule, especially with the Xeno, Xeno game series. This one kind of took after. And then finally, collect income. And the income we just kind of track on the capital, as you can see there. That's where our money pile is. Okay, and then the game continues. Western Europe and yada, yada, yada. Um, just for fun, you can cycle by going on the bottom right hand corner, you can cycle all the way. So let's just stop here and take a look at uh, uh, UK4. So you can see the, the battle kind of seesaws. It looks like the uh, Western Europeans retook Western Germany, Yugoslavia. Um, well, they even took back Greece here at this point. Looks like they've got South Korea. But here's the end game. Soviet turn seven, it looks like. Uh, yeah, we have a substantial army in Pakistan and India's on the ropes. Um, well, the allies are in force in huh, Italy and Western Europe. I, I can't remember which side I was or what the result was of this game. But anyway, it's a ripping good time. Every time I played, this was great. At any rate, this is a, a great game. I think it deserves more daylight than it, it, it gets or even got. If this looks interesting to you, you can always reach out to me. I'll play a game with you. Or you can reach out to this fellow here on the forums. He goes by the Janus. There's this thread, which I will link in the description box below. It's the East and West thread, essentially, the, the active one. Uh, it's too bad that that this is essentially unfindable. Um, and if anybody has or knows where to get more copies, you know, leave leave a comment below. Or just leave a comment if you played this game, if you have any thoughts on it, it'd be nice to hear. But for now, we're gonna go ahead and transition to the review of the other third party variant, which is Table Tactics uh, Central Powers. And this I actually do have a physical copy of. So this is my copy of Central Powers, but like the last segment, I'm going to have photographs from Board Game Geek scroll across the screen so that you can see what this looks like brand new. And while that's going on, I'm going to go ahead and introduce the game. Central Powers is not a World War I game. Now, it's understandable that most people would think that it is, given the name, but let me address this head on. It's not a World War I game. In fact, this game is a direct copy of Axis and Allies Classic, the Milton Bradley 2nd Edition. The rule set is exactly the same. The setup is in fact exactly the same. The big difference is that pieces have been swapped out. In other words, certain items have been removed and new units have been added in and the values have been changed for those new units. The best way to think of this is Axis and Allies Classic fought with World War I technology. If you can absorb that and you understand it, then you won't be disappointed when you open the box and find this out. Okay, so I've got the whole thing set up. I'm gonna now transition to my board and show you what's going on. Welcome to Axis and Allies Central Powers by Table Tactics. This might be a little overwhelming and to some of you it might be a little bit familiar, but to help make sense of what's going on in this game, we're gonna focus on Japan. So I'm gonna reorient the camera so that we're looking at just a small section of the board so we can analyze what's going on. Okay, as stated earlier in the video, this is an identical setup to Japan's out-of-box setup from Axis and Allies Classic, but with the pieces swapped for the new pieces in Central Powers. First, I'll direct your attention to these artillery pieces. Artillery pieces are now where fighters used to be. So Japan starts with five fighters, but as you can see now they have five artillery pieces. Armor units have been replaced with the machine gun, Bomber units have been replaced with the armor. AA guns have been replaced with fighters. Aircraft carriers have been replaced with cruisers. And in the case of the Allies, submarines have been replaced with destroyers. Axis submarines stay submarines. And so now the next question might be, okay, that's great, but how do these pieces function? And rather than show you the rules or speaking into the camera, I'm gonna go ahead and show you a battle board that I had custom built for this game. So this should look familiar to most of you, hopefully. This is the same type of battle board that is used in Classic, but I used an editor and added in the silhouettes of the new units. 
So this one, for instance, is the machine gun. You can see that it attacks on a two uh, while it defends on a three. Similarly, the artillery attacks on a one and defends on a four. So I'll draw your attention to these two columns. The attack columns for the three and the four are very limited. Uh, in fact, two of these three units that attack at a three or four are naval units. So the only unit that attacks at a decent value is this Mark II tank, is what it's called. Every other piece attacks at a lesser value than it defends on, with that exception and with this one that we'll get to in a moment. The game calls this a half track, but obviously there were no half tracks in World War I. I couldn't let that stand, so I replaced that table tactics piece with the truck. This unit does not start on the board. You have to purchase it after the start of the game. The same is true of AA guns. You'll notice bombers are not on here at all because you cannot purchase them. This is the single sheet of rules that comes with the game. I'll just point out here that the turn order has also been changed to Germany first, followed by the UK, Japan, and then the USSR. And finally, before I pan back over to the board, let's review the tech chart. Uh, jet power has been replaced with plane launched torpedoes. Rockets have been replaced with zeppelins, essentially the same uh, technology, just a different name. Super subs remains, mustard gas has replaced long range aircraft, industrial technology remains, and then the super destroyers replaced the heavy bombers. So there's no be all end all tech like there was in the original Axis and Allies classic. Okay, so I kind of have it set up now, zoomed in on Germany, because I want to discuss a few things. Given that Germany goes first in the couple of games that I played, it usually means that you're going to be launching an attack on Karelia on the first turn, and you'll be able to take it relatively easily. And because most units have such a great defense value, once you take a territory, it can be and usually is very difficult for your opponent to take it back. So although it does seem like the attacker might have the disadvantage, it is also true that it seems that once you take hold of a territory, if your supply lines are good and if you're playing good clean axis and allies, you have a good chance of holding on to them. So in short, the fact that the attack power has been cut down cuts both ways. When it comes to costs, everything basically costs five IPCs. Even these fighters cost five IPCs. Their values have been changed to attack one and defend one, and for anybody wincing at that, they still have a movement of four and they are quite useful. I'll share some pictures from an active game where we had some pretty vicious and wild fighter versus sub battles and fighter versus transport battles. The Mark II tank, these things have a great attack power, but they're pretty measly on defense and they're very expensive. They're eight IPCs per armor unit. One of the more versatile units that comes out of this variant is called the half track, but as I stated earlier, I replaced that piece with a truck from historical board gaming. And outside of what I've already shown on camera, this is the only rule, and that is that when you are playing with these things, you can load two of them on one transport. They also happen to be able to move two spaces. Essentially, they're an armor unit that doesn't attack on three. It attacks two, defends two, costs five, but you can load two on a transport, and this is critical for obvious reasons. There are essentially now two land units that move at two. I managed to play this game two times in the last couple of years, and both times it was just an amazing experience. I was pretty hesitant to try this out at first because I thought it was kind of lazy that the game designers would just rip off the initial setup, but now I feel almost the exact opposite. They took a design and game mechanics that worked really well and just imported in new pieces with different values. So if you loved Axis and Allies Classic and played a lot of it back in the day, let's say, but you got a little bored of it because it got stale, doing the same things with the same pieces, you're gonna love this. This keeps the original excitement and fun that was inherent in the original game rules and game setup, but it changes things just enough that your tactics are gonna be different. There's gonna be new fights and new battles and new strategies, and much like East and West, it's just a really fun game once you get into it. This concludes episode four in the Axis and Allies Clinic series. This video was a review of two third-party variants. The first was East and West by Imp Games, released in the year 2000. And the second was Central Powers by Table Tactics, released in 1995. 
I feel that both of these versions deserve more daylight than they get. And if you should run into a copy or have one of these, I don't think that you would be wasting your time if you dusted it off and gave it a play. In any case, let me know what you think about these versions. Have you ever played them? Have you seen them out on the market? Leave a comment in the description box below. Thanks for watching this. All the best from the good captain and bye bye.